Danger. Hundreds of dramatic behind-the-scenes adventures are all part of the Clyde Beatty story. Here is the story of The Lost City. I was sweltering at the Saigon airport, waiting for a plane to take me to Rangoon to check a shipment of wild animals, when to my amazement, I heard someone quietly say, I do believe it's Clyde Beatty. I glanced up to see the broad grin of my old friend Dick Rossi, one of the original flying tigers. I soon learned he was still taking to the air, running a transport service from Saigon through Bangkok to Rangoon. In a couple of hours, we were 7,000 feet over the tangled jungles of Cambodia, headed for Rangoon. It's really a break for me, Clyde, having someone else piloting this heap for a change. Oh, this is fun. Hey, that's some mess of jungle down there. Ah, uh, you have to look at it as much as I do. You'd be sick of it, too. Hate to get forced down in that stuff. Don't even mention it. Maybe I'm spoiled, Dick, but after flying that twin beach I've got back home, this crate handles like a dump truck. Look, this is just a gypsy outfit. You can't expect deluxe equipment. The ships on my freight run are held together with bailing wire and chewing gum. <laughs> Now you tell me. Now, don't worry, pal. All Elsie here can glide a thousand miles on just her reputation alone. Oh? Well, then we better get upstairs where there's room, huh? Hey, take it easy, Clyde. This ain't your twin beach. Uh-oh. It's okay. The old girl's just pumping for air, that's all. With well, the mixture's too lean. Yeah. There, that'll fix it. Brother, for a minute I thought that starboard motor was going to quit. These motors quit? <laughs> don't be silly. Why, I would... Uh, you were saying, Mr. Rossi? Well, I'll be. That never happened before. Well, it's happened now. We're starting to lose altitude. Turn her over to me, Clyde. You better get Bangkok on the radio. Our call letters are LC-1029. Right. LC-1029 calling Bangkok Tower. LC-1029 calling Bangkok Tower. Come in, please. Don't worry, Clyde. We can limp in, okay? Worry? Who's worried? Sailing wire and chewing gum are pretty tough stuff. <laughs> Bangkok Tower to LC-1029. That's my boy talking. Bangkok Tower to LC-1029. Receiving you loud and clear. Over. Tell him we're limping in and to keep in touch. Now what? Elsie, don't do that. Come on, come on. Stand by, Bangkok. Stand by. Uh, yeah, they're both dead now. Don't look now, my friend, but that jungle's getting closer and closer. Yeah, and if Elsie doesn't stop this foolishness, we're going to be sitting right in it. We return to Clyde Beatty in just a moment. And now, back to Clyde Beatty's adventure, The Lost City. Bangkok Tower. Bangkok Tower. We're losing altitude rapidly. Stand by. Come on, Elsie. Come on. What about bailing out? You get strung up on those trees? Might as well ride her down, Clyde. Oh, I guess you're right. Catch, Elsie. Catch. Come on, run. Good girl, Elsie. Elsie, we love you. Now behave yourself. I think we've lost too much altitude to make it back to Bangkok. Call him and ask him if there's a place within 100 miles we can set down for repairs. Where are we? You see that big lake up ahead? Uh, yeah. Hey, that's a big puddle of water. They call it Tunley Sop. On this course, we'll fly over the north end of it. Well, I'll check with Bangkok. LC-1029 to Bangkok Tower. We're cruising on one motor. We'll cross north end of Tunley Sop. Tunley stop in about uh, 15 minutes. 15 minutes. Request possible landing place in this vicinity. Over. Bangkok Tower to LC 1029. Suggest you head north up the sea reef and land in clearing near the Angkor Wat. If you can't make necessary repairs, call us. We will send ship for you. Over. Okay, Dick. Yep. Okay, Bangkok. We'll call upon landing. Over and out. Well... Looks like this routine flight has turned into a sightseeing trip. I hear those ruins are something to see. You mean Angkor Wat? Yeah. They say the city was built back in the Middle Ages. I've read about it. The Khmers built it, didn't they? Well, I don't remember. But whoever they were, they did a terrific job. Well, the original city was supposed to have been larger than Paris. Housed a population of over two million people. Wow. That doesn't seem possible way out here in the jungle. I wonder what happened to all those people. Nobody knows for sure. It's a mystery. 
Now, yeah, we'll get first-hand looks in about a half an hour. Dick. Dick, look over there. Do you see what I see? I see a flock of trees. That's all I... Hey, wait. Aren't those towers sticking up through the jungle? Yeah. Can't be Angkor Wat, can it? Nah. We're still at least 50 miles away. Well, those are buildings, all right. Lots of them. I see smoke rising from those ruins. Doesn't look like a forest fire. No, it's coming from one of those buildings. There must be people down there. Impossible. The jungle's too dense. Say, Dick, maybe... Maybe we've stumbled onto a city like Angkor, a lost city with people living in it. It's the fuel pump, all right, Clyde. Yeah, it's shot. What do we do now? I'll call Bangkok and have him bring us one. That means we're stuck for the night. It'll be dark in an hour. You might as well look at those ruins of Angkor while I make the call. Yeah. I'll meet you over there. All right. Hello! Hello, monsieur! Who's that? Monsieur! I have a plane from deep inside Angkor Wat. Are you all right? Yes, the plane was forced down. Say, I didn't expect to see anyone here. I am Armand Bouvet. <laughs> How do you do, sir? You are wondering what my business is here? Well, I am professor of archaeology from the Sorbonne in Paris. Well, my name's Beatty, Clyde Beatty. Oh, you came alone, Beatty? No, there's a fellow American with me. He owns the ship. Here's my friend now. Oh, so. Well, looks like we've got company, huh, Clive? Uh, this is Professor Beauvais. Professor, meet Dick Rossi. Hi. Uh, pleasure, monsieur. You've come just in time. The native boys on this expedition with me are fine lads, but not very good conversationalists. Well, have you been here long, Professor? Oh, uh, three months this time. I am searching for clues about the people who built Angkor Wat. And then we can talk about that during dinner. Huh? Uh, you gentlemen will join me. Did you say Dinner? I cannot set too elegant a table, monsieur, but you are welcome. We accept your invitation. Lead on, Professor. And so you see, gentlemen, this relic of the ancient Khmer civilization was begun about 860 A.D. Windy old bird, isn't it? This is very interesting. The Khmers were master builders... Undoubtedly, the work was done by hundreds of thousands of slaves. As a matter of fact, one of the many explanations for the mysterious disappearance of the Khmers is a possible uprising of the slaves who may have slaughtered every man, woman, and child, thus removing at once the entire civilization of the extremely advanced Khmer race. I'm sleepy. Quiet. Oh, that's interesting, Professor. Tell me, uh, is this the only city built by the Khmers? No, but it is the largest that has been discovered. Well, we spotted some ruins flying low over the jungle this afternoon. Well, there are other remains in the vicinity scattered along both sides of the river. But, however, they are not as conspicuous as Angkor Wat. We didn't see these ruins along the river. It was deep in the jungle, at least 50 miles from here. What did you say? We saw them, all right. And what's more, we saw smoke coming from one of them. Smoke? That's right. Oh, well, this is a fantastic. Are there people living in that section of the jungle? Well, there should not be, but tell me, did this smoke come from a possible forest fire? Definitely not. Uh, did you mark this place on your map? Yes. Uh, then you must lead me there tomorrow. Not me. I run an airline, yes, not an arc. You do not understand. When they fly me my new fuel pump in tomorrow, I'm going to cack out. Don't you realize you have discovered a lost city? Hooray for us. And if there are people there, they might supply the answer to one of the greatest mysteries of all time. You mean the secret of the disappearance of the Khmers? Exactly. Well, count me in. You guys have forgotten something. What's that? Those jokers might turn out to be the descendants of the slaves the professor was talking about. Oh? So? They were supposed to have wiped out the Khmers. Well, if they did, maybe they want to keep their secret. Clyde Beatty will return in just a moment. And now, back to Clyde Beatty and the Lost City. After the repair of his plane, Dick Rossi leaves Clyde and Professor Beauvais to the exploration of the Cambodian jungle. The party pushes off from Angkor Wat in the direction of the ruins Clyde had spotted from the air. With three native boys slashing a trail through the tangled growth, Clyde and the professor hurry along in search of the lost city. The jungle seems to be getting thicker and thicker, Professor. Which convinces me even more no one could be living here. Still, we'd better be on our toes. Quite right, baby, quite right. You'll find those three native boys up ahead to be enough and courageous. Speaking of the boys, I don't hear their machetes cutting through the brush. We must have lagged far behind. Oh, they may have stopped for a rest. Let us hurry up and see. Professor, wait. What is it, baby? Look. Oh, that's a trail. It has ended. Yeah. 
You can see where the boys stopped cutting. But, but where are they? I don't get it. There must be some sign of them around. It... Professor, over here. Oh, you found something? Yes, our supply packs and three machetes, broken in pieces. Well, what does this mean? Well, the boys must have been jumped. Oh, but there's no sign of a struggle. It must have happened so fast they didn't have a chance. Well, but do you think they have been killed? Not here, at any rate. There's no sign of blood. Well, what can we do? Well, we can't go forward. We'd never get through that tangle of brush without machetes. Oh, well, we'd better hurry back as we came. What about the native boys? We can't just leave them. Well, we can't go forward without machetes. Well, our boys didn't just float away through the trees, did... or did they? Float through the trees? What do you mean, Betty? Never mind. Just grab one of those packs. I'll get the other. But there's... there's no time to lose. Now hurry back down the trail. I don't understand, Betty. The jungle has ears. But I know. I'll explain later. Right now, we've got to look like we're heading out of here. We can rest here for a couple of hours. We'll grab a bite to eat. By that time, the moon will be up and we can go back. Go back? That's right. We've got to find those boys. I admire your concern about them, Betty. But in this case, I I don't think it's wise. I think we've traveled far enough to convince anyone who might have followed us that we intend to keep going. If we're very cautious, we can get back undetected. And if not? If not, well, we'll be sure to find out what happened to our native boys. This is the place, Professor. Now, keep your fingers crossed. Mm, They have not been uncrossed since we started back into this forsaken jungle. (laughs) We are once more at the blank end of the trail. By what magic do we go forward? Before we go forward, we go up. Up? Whoever kidnapped our boys didn't come through the underbrush. That leaves one other possibility. They dropped down from the trees. Oh? If we were to climb that tree, what do you suppose we'd find? If you set an electric tramway, I should not be at all surprised. I'll bet there's a system of trails through the dense trees high above the ground. Fantastic. Not fantastic, just clever. Come on, let's see. Uh, Well, I am not much at climbing, baby. It's an easy climb. The bark is rough and there are plenty of branches to hold on to. Now, come on. Uh, Here, let me get a hold of that. You were right. This is amazing. It is a series of narrow passageways. Exactly. Twenty feet above the ground. Now we've got to move cautiously. Well, will these balls hold us? Sure. They're heavy split timbers and are fastened securely from tree to tree. Ingenious. Very ingenious. Let's go. Quietly now. These trails probably all lead to the city. Do you realize they can't be seen from above or below? I cannot think of a better way to keep a lost city lost. Sure, Professor. This is better protection for a city than a dozen high walls or moats. Indeed, yes. No enemy could successfully attack such a place. Uh, It's getting lighter just ahead. I think we're coming to a clearing. Uh, Should we draw our guns, Betty? No, but be alert. Uh, Now, we'd better get on hands and knees, and whatever you do, don't make any loud noise. Easy now. Just a few more feet and we can see into the clearing. Professor. Look. Magnificent. Magnificent. It's the lost city. An amazing example of ancient Khmer architecture. On the steps of that building, a group of people. At least they don't look savage. Looks can be deceiving. They must be having some sort of powwow. Say, aren't those our boys in the center of the group there? Uh, yes, they seem to have entered into the conversation. Well, if we can get just a little closer, maybe we can hear what they're saying. Listen, one of them is making a speech. Can you understand it, Professor? Uh, vaguely. That dialect is archaic, but I think I can transpose it. What's he saying? Well, as nearly as I can make out, he's telling our boys they must reconcile themselves to the fact they are to remain in the lost city forever. Uh Uh-oh. That could happen to us. He says we are peace-loving people. 
We have taken refuge here from an evil world. None shall come to disturb us. I get it. These people aren't direct descendants of the Khmers or their slaves. They're just some Cambodians who've run away from war and bloodshed. They've hidden themselves here in the jungle. You're right. They may have been here for generations, living sort of a Shangri-La existence. Since we have found them in this lost city, hiding in the ancient buildings, they're afraid we might bring others who would destroy them as the Khmers were destroyed. Oh, we had better leave, Beatty. As much as I love ancient ruins, I shouldn't like to live in one for the rest of my life. We've got to rescue those native boys. Uh, I've got an idea. Huh? If it works, we'll be all right. And if it doesn't... It'll work. Now listen carefully. I'm going around to the other side. In a little while, you'll hear the snarl of a panther. And when you do, get ready to act. What am I to do? Well, as you can see, they're unarmed. If they think a wild animal is about to attack, huh? they should dash away for weapons. When they do, I'll drop down, get the boys, and bring them up here. Now, we'll have to move fast. Be ready to give us a hand up if we make it. Do you understand? I understand. But it's such a desperate move. How can it succeed? Because it is desperate, it has to succeed. <laughs> I crawled along the trail to a point quite close to where the people of the lost city were grouped on the temple steps. In the bright moonlight, the beauty of the ancient building was breathtaking. I was close enough to see that every inch of wall space was covered with intricate carvings, masterworks of artistry centuries and centuries old. The jungle pressed in all around, a protective covering for these people who wanted so desperately to keep their hidden sanctuary a secret from the world. My imitation of a savage panther was immediately effective. The group of people on the steps bounded away from what they thought to be an attacking cat. Our three native boys froze where they stood. I dropped down into the small clearing and dashed toward them. And finally, one of them recognized me. Baby! Baby, come on! Hurry! Hurry! Follow me! Please, please, please! Please, please! Come on! Come on! Oh, you've made it! You've made it! Not yet. We'd better get moving before they find out what happened. And you mean to tell me you two were foolish enough to go back after those native boys? My dear Rossi, I had no choice. <laughs> I didn't either. Anyway, it wasn't so terribly dangerous. Uh, monsieur, the lion came out. May I point out that there is a vast difference between most people's conception of danger and yours? You can say that again, Professor. This Beatty character thinks a little jaunt into a lion's den is the way to spend a quiet afternoon. <laughs> well, isn't it? Hmm. Incidentally, are you going to make an official report about finding the lost city? I, uh, I don't think we can. But why not? Well, during our mad dash through the jungle, I lost the map. But surely you can recall the location. Strangely enough, I seem to have forgotten the exact place. What? With a memory like yours? Well, that is ridiculous. Why, even I can... Uh, oh, wait. I think... I think I know what you mean, Betty. I think you do, Professor. It's wonderful when people can live in peace. Let's do what we can to help those people in the lost city keep that peace. Now, here is the star of our show, Cly Beatty. I hope you enjoyed the journey to the lost city, for this was one of the most fantastic experiences of my career. I'll bring you another exciting adventure the next time we meet. stories are based upon incidents in the career of the world-famous Clyde Beatty and the Clyde Beatty Circus. The Clyde Beatty Show is produced and transcribed by Shirley Thomas, written by Robert T. Smith and Frank Hart Kelsey. Music composed and conducted by Albert Glasser. All names used were fictional, and any resemblance to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. This is a Commodore production.